for our favorite award-winning National Book Award, I'll say one of our favorites, sorry guys. <laughs> one of our favorite National Book Award finalists and local East Callis author, Howard Norman. Um, today is the publication birthday for his last work of fiction, The Ghost Clause. Um, it's a spooky tale told from the point of view of a ghost residing in an 1845 farmhouse in rural Vermont. And I, I wonder wherever did Howard get the idea for this book? <laughs> the Ghost Clause is a testament to love, or a testament of love to marriage, to home, to community. Howard's precise and provocative language draws the reader into the vitality of everyday life and the importance of connection. Whether we make those connections through poetry or through interactions at the Adamant Co-op, which many of us here do, the Ghost Clause presents us with a tantalizing cast of characters, including one very engaging ghost, who I said is the, the narrator. Um, I liked this ghost immediately when he told us on page six to me, the library is the most comfortable room in the house. It's where all the good books are. I have to agree, and I can say the same for Bear Pond Books, which is also mentioned in the book. Thank you, Howard. Um, I'd also like to thank Orca Media. They're filming this event tonight. And I'd like to let you know um, that tonight's event is our kickoff for our sizzling summer of events here at Bear Pond Books on July 16th. We host National Book Award finalist and Pulitzer Prize finalist Rebecca Mackay for a talk on her novel, The Great Believers. We also will be hosting a local author with their debut novels on July 23rd. We host Susan Ritz. Hi, Susan. <laughs> and on July 30th, we will host Makaya Bay Galt. Uh, both of these authors have new literary thrillers out this month. I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter that's being passed around. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter um, to learn more about these events. Tonight, Howard will read from the Ghost Clause, answer a few questions, and then sign books while we feast on cake and wine. <laughs> Sounds like a perfect night, right? <laughs> Howard Norman is a three-time winner of National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship and a winner of the Landon Award for Fiction. His novels, The Northern Lights and The Bird Artist, were both nominated for National Book Awards. He is also author of the novels, The Museum Guard, The Haunting of Elle, What is Left the Daughter, Next Life Might Be Kinder, and My Darling Detective, most of which are here available tonight. Uh, he divides his time between East Callis, Vermont, and Washington, D.C. Please help me welcome Howard Norman. Um, I found this quote, um, thinking of Tom Absher, I, I found this quote from Heraclides. It says, a gathering of friends is a reprieve from the rest of the world. So thanks for being here um, tonight. I wanted to write a novel uh, that was, am I supposed to? Could you use that? Some people can hear just a little bit. I, want, I wanted to, to write a novel told in ghost first person and set in our farmhouse, which the novel is. The demographics of this story is basically uh, Jane's library and out to Adamant. Um, the novel's narrator is a guy named Simon Inniscourt. He's a writer who is keeping a diary describing the lives, social, erotic, and academic, and everything else, of a new marriage that's taking place in his former farmhouse, the marriage of Zachary and Muriel. Simon's own widow, Lorca, is a painter and figures, importantly, right up to the last page. At the center of the plot, or several plots, is a missing child case 
which is lar largely solved by Erica Heilman. And a private investigator who lives next door to Muriel and Zachary, himself a private investigator. So I wish to thank Erica Heilman for solving a case that my other characters could not solve. <laughs> I don't know if she's here, but she's running late. Yes, she's I, on her way. Um, and while she's not here, I'll tell you really quickly. When I gave her this manuscript, she said, "Well, Howard, you." write in this book that the Erica Heilman character has a, has a kind of uh, uh, filthy mouth, but you didn't give me any words that would indicate that, so you need to add. <laughs> so, I won't even say them. And so I did. <laughs> um, many email attachments from all over the country have arrived containing so-called ghost clauses. I think there's about 100 to now. To now. <laughs> While these vary in content, basically the legal document known as a ghost clause states that if the new owners of a house experience a presence or revenant that they don't think they can live with, the previous owner is obligated to buy back the house. There's a time limit, usually. And these are really popular in the 1800s and early 1900s. Anyway, for someone like me who lives so much in the spectral world, this is all very interesting to me. So I'm going to read the shortest chapter um, it's called The Ghost Clause. The ghost first-person narrator, Simon, is telling us about his widow who is on the verge of selling her farmhouse. I tried to find a word uh, for several years that described a sense of a momentum we might try to construct in our, our lives that could possibly continue on after. And the only word I could come up with was ongoingness. Today, within the ongoingness, a memory arrived unbidden, as memories always do. I had been sitting in the library reading Wallace Stevens when I looked up and noticed that Muriel, she's the young wife in the house, had added something new to the library wall the framed copy of the original deed which contained the ghost clause. I had long thought that, in one way or another, almost every day Lorca and I had spent in our house connected us to the past. The architecture itself, the columned chronicle of heights of children formerly in residence, written in pencil alongside the pantry door, the decays and repairs, the vague smell of lightning that never leaves the nearest maple and drifts in through the library screen window on the breeze, moss on the roof shingles, secret passageways of the mice, the morning, midday, and evening light striking each window differently, a century's layers of white paint, maybe more than a century's, the branch that after decades finally reaches a length where a squirrel can acrobat onto the roof, wallpaper that peels away to reveal other wallpaper, the discarded rectangles of gravestones that some previous owner used to shore up and balance the back porch, the hieroglyphic porcupine tooth marks on the stanchions under the mudroom, how the bases of bedposts made barely detectable indentations in the planks through generations of lovemaking and when children hopped on beds like trampolines. Every nook and cranny archives time. Built in 1845, sure, yet who knows, Maybe for the farmhouse, these are still early days. I thought of the house as here before the Civil War, perhaps because I like to think of its first existing at a relatively peaceful time in Vermont. Lorca and I learned that for five years it served as a music school. There were no classrooms per se, but various instructors of piano, violin, viola, flute, even harpsichord and harp would be paid a small fee to teach students in the downstairs rooms. If the teachers arrived from long distances, they stayed over in the upstairs bedrooms. We read in a diary written by a neighbor from that period that a violin and a woodwind teacher had fallen in love in the farmhouse, each having traveled from upstate New York a long way back then for employment. I once attempted and fell short to write a novel based on their courtship. Once when Lorca had pneumonia and had spiked a fever of 104, she claimed that tossing and turning in sweaty sheets one night in our bed, she heard harpsichord music floating in the air. And then, 
three months after I died, I observed a widow in her privacy, which you don't often see except in certain classical paintings. I was standing out front of the farmhouse, looking in through the library window, and there was my wife, Lorca, sitting in the rocking chair, reading Middlemarch. I cannot tell you how many times she went on George Eliot Jags, and one year she read not only three George Eliot novels, but a collection of essays, too. At least once a year she read Middlemarch, but readily admitted that when picking up the novel to read again, she didn't always start on page one. <laughs> she, she called that reading in Middlemarch. <laughs> Then Lorca set the book down on a rocker, sat at her desk, and looked to be writing out a list of some sort. Later, when I looked, I saw she had jotted down notes, one, two, three, four, five, of things to be sure to tell the prospective buyers when she toured them through our house. It gave me a start, but then again, I wasn't totally surprised. Well, I was and I wasn't, that she had decided to sell. In the end, she refused to work with a realtor. She just sent word out, mainly through Vanessa at the co-op, and it made me smile to remember what Lorca had said about her. Quote, if you want something known, tell the BBC or tell Vanessa. <laughs> One evening, I followed Lorca through the house as she rehearsed a tour. She auditioned tones of voice, separated out certain details from things we'd read in the historical society bulletins, but mostly chose anecdotes from her own experiences. Her voice broke during her descriptions of the enormous wood-burning stove and that the library was once the birthing room. Yet, as it turned out, only one tour was necessary. Realtors called making a house presentable for strangers as staging. But Lorca wasn't about to do that. When speaking of our house to friends or acquaintances, she often called it Hamish, a Yiddish word meaning something like cozy and lived in. That is clearly how she wanted to present our house. It was our cartoonist friend, Ed, within a day or two of word getting out that Lorca intended to sell, who had suggested Muriel and Zachary. On the phone with Lorca, she had the speakerphone on while she continued to make a pasta sauce. He had vouched for them. Quote, Muriel Struth and Zachary Anders, he said. Different last names for professional reasons. She's a professor in New Hampshire. He's an investigator. Has a new job with an agency in Montpelier, but they're definitely married. I've jotted down their names, Lorca said. I'd say they're a solid couple, Ed said. They carry themselves well. They've been renting here in Brookfield but they want to find their own place. Ed, of course they come highly recommended because it's dear old you telling me about them. How are you, Lorca? Oh, big question, she said, full of little daily things that seem to add up to, I'm just okay, I suppose. The moment I heard your voice, I wanted to say, Simon and you were such dear friends. I miss him a lot, he said. We had our boys' nights out. Conversations as secret lives, Simon called it, she said. I don't quite know. Con conversations as secret lives, Simon called it. I don't quite know how to say this, but are you sure you want to sell the house? It's too much for me. I understand. Too much on so many levels, in so many ways, Ed. But we all had some such great times here, didn't we? Yes, we did. When can you drive down for dinner? I don't feel I'd be very good company. You can't seriously think that would matter to us. In a week or so, then. Do you know where you'll live? I'm going to move into the apartment above the Adamant Co-op. My studio's already there, as you know. There's three big rooms, and I've got carpenters lined up. They just need a start date to add a good-sized bathroom, a quite luxur luxurious clawfoot tub and all of that. Your atelier in Adamant, Vermont. I'll be considered the expat from East Callis, she said. <laughs> That's actually pretty funny, Ed said. I have to write that down. <laughs> you ask how I was doing. Not so good some days, less good others. Me and Curtis will drive up or meet you in town, or you come here, okay? The drawing you made, Ed, and what you said at the memorial meant the world to me. I'm having the drawing framed. I'll have this young couple get in touch, he said. Look, why not ask them to come over this Sunday, give them directions to the house, will you? Bye-bye, see you soon. That Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, a Toyota pickup with Vermont plates pulled up across from the house. Muriel was at the wheel. 
She parked next to Lorca's 1985 Volvo wagon. My pickup was in the barn, which had over 200,000 miles on it and ran like a Swedish watch. I stood looking out the front living room window, open to its screen. It had been seasonably warm early in early September, but this day, under a clear blue sky, had a slight chill in the air. You could hear rain in the trees from the previous night's storm. Muriel was wearing blue jeans, a yellow cotton sweater, black flats. She had a veritable cascade of hair, perhaps a shade lighter auburn than Lorca's, and it looked to me by the expression on her face as she took in the farmhouse that she was already convinced. But it's possible that I may have conflated her expression with my wife Lorca's when she herself had first seen the house. Memory intervenes, memory confuses, right? Zachary was about half an inch taller than Muriel. He held a notebook and pen, a man who wanted to check his observations later, I thought. He wore neatly pressed khaki trousers, a black t-shirt under a blue cotton work shirt, also neatly ironed. Looking at the farmhouse roof, he jotted something down. After formal introductions were made in the kitchen, Lorca offered coffee and homemade lemon squares, but only Muriel accepted. She carried her cup of coffee and ate a lemon square while on Lorca's tour. We can go out to the barn later if you want, Lorca said. It's a sight to see. Lorca commenced with somewhat hesitant tone, but fairly soon she changed to a conversational one. She told how the house was built in 1845 and how the eldest two of the Peck family sons fought in the Civil War and had survived. She showed them a photograph of the Peck family reunion at a long table set out in front of the house. The pantry has such low counters, Lorca said, because Will Peck's wife, Dorothy, was quite a short woman. They toured the dining room and the living room, and Lorca pointed out the wide ceiling beams. And then they walked into the library. You're a literary scholar or professor, isn't that right, Muriel? So far, I'm just an adjunct professor, Muriel said. Well, I'm thinking you might like this library. Lorca talked about the family photographs and frames in the front hallway. Then her tour proceeded upstairs. As you can see, she said, the master bedroom has the sweeping view. It's a room with five doors, too. If you crane your neck a little, you can look out and just see the roof of my husband's cabin. He wrote some of his books up there. Some summers he practically lived up there, it seemed. After Lorca revealed all the storage spaces, everyone went downstairs and into the kitchen, where Lorca asked Muriel and Zachary to sit with her at the table. And there she spoke about the artesian well, about the neighbors, about the acreage and property tax, about the oil furnace and wood stove. And, and, and it's, she said, if you're not comfortable with the wood stoves, you might consider propane. Wood stoves are demanding, but they're so comfy, middle of winter, you know. It's a wonderful house, Muriel said. Well, I should tell you something right away, Lorca said. I won't expect you to be comfortable with it either. But if you go up to the cabin, you'll see this lovely little cemetery. It's got a stone wall built by our neighbor. Anyway, there's just one gravestone so far, my husband Simon's. But I'd like to be buried there, too. I went through all the legal petitions and paperwork with the town clerk and the state, and so now there lies my husband. And that's the thing. I intend to visit him as often as I like, as you might expect. Of course, if you'd like me to call ahead of time, well, I'd prefer not to. I would. So you see, no matter what, so no, so you see, no matter what you might use the cabin for eventually, the little cemetery must stay as it is. I'll be fully, re, full, fully responsible for its upkeep. Muriel waited a moment and then said, "You would never need to call ahead, isn't that right, Zachary?" Mrs. Inniscourt, of course, Zachary said. I noticed some interesting trees up there. My husband planted Japanese crab apples. The climate obviously suits them. I might have some more planted. Simon had an orchard in mind. Lorca made Muriel a second cup of coffee. It's really a wonderful house, Zachary said. Lorca looked out to the field and back. For a moment, I thought perhaps because of the word wonderful that she might be having second thoughts. We had heard of that phenomenon, someone suddenly changing their mind about selling, even as late as when the deed was about to be transferred, the bill of sale about to be signed, all parties present and accounted for. And so now I half expected Lorca to say, I'll be in touch, or something along those lines. Lorca, it has to be so difficult even thinking about leaving here, Muriel said. So much life, obviously, lived. So much life. You know, I'm pretty good at accessing a 
foretaste of regret, you might say, Lorca said, <laughs> knowing ahead of time if I desperately regret something. I admit to some sleepless nights over selling the house over this decision, but it's right for me at this point in life. Silence for a few minutes. And here's something else, Lorca said. Some time ago, we discovered there was something called a ghost clause written into the original deed back in the day. It was the deed that Will Peck's widow signed over to the next owner, a man named Harold Ticho. He owned the inn at long last, south of here in Chester, but he wanted to sell it and move here. The crux of the ghost clause is, if the seller of the house is aware of a malevolent entity occupying the house, the seller has to inform the purchaser of it ahead of time. Because if it turns out this entity is a rabble rouser of some sort, or I suppose however malevolent might be interpreted, then the seller is obligated to repurchase the house. Say, for instance, I knew there was a malevolent ghost and it threw pots and pans around or something, anything. I'd have to buy back the house from you, no questions asked. The validity of reporting such things is unassailable. And I mean in a court of law. And I guess that it still hold up, too. Sorry. There's water there, too. I'm sorry. No, it's just <laughs> ridiculous. Um, mm. And I guess that that still hold up too. Um, Zachary said, um, "Did you and your husband ever?" Oh goodness, no. Lorca said. She was shaking her head slowly back and forth. Goodness, goodness, no. No malevolent spirit did we ever experience ever. <laughs> well, Zachary asked, "How about?" A benevolent one. <laughs> Not that either, Lorca said. Not on the premises. I mean, this is an old farmhouse. It's got creek creeks, a warp in some post or other or whatnot. It readily offers its complaints, that's for sure. But when my husband was alive, I did that too. <laughs> they all fell into genuine laughter. Muriel actually spit out some coffee, which made everyone laugh more. <laughs> Tell me more of what, about who you both are, Lorca said. That would help. Muriel then mentioned her doctoral work at Tufts University, and she was going to defend her dissertation in December. I'm confident it'll turn into something more full-time, she said. I've been encouraged to have that confidence by my department chair. She's turning her dissertation into a book, Zachary said. She's got a university press more than interest. That's impressive, Lorca said. Muriel looked uncomfortable at having boasted even the little she had, but still she had spoken truthfully. And you, Zachary, Lorca says, asked, well, I'm the new guy, junior investigator at the Green Mountain Agency in Montpelier, though I did have experience with an agency in Saratoga Springs, but Muriel and I want to live in Vermont, even though it's a commute for her. You may not realize it, Lorca said, but just next door is Erica Heilman, an investigator herself, an estimable one. Great reputation, Zachary said. I've talked with her a few times on the phone. I never knew where she lived, though. Next house down. That'd make, I mean, Zachary said, if things should work out, Muriel said. Yes, said Lorca, that would mean two investigators on the same road. <laughs> By my lights, the Green Mountain Agency is fortunate to have Zachary, Muriel said. They must feel the same because they've assigned him a very urgent, very, I don't know what, devastating case. Oh, yes. And what's that case, if I may ask, Lorca said, if you're allowed to talk about it. It's public knowledge, Zachary said. I'm leading a missing child case. I take it you mean Corrine Moore, Lorca said. I've known Corrine since she was born. I'm sorry to even mention it, Zachary said. It's got to be hard on everyone in this community. For Joanna and Devon Moore, a waking nightmare, Lorca said. I have a painting studio over the Adamant Co-op, not a half a mile from the Moore's house. So far, I'm solely assigned, Zachary said. There's been a complaint about that because I'm new, but I worked on a missing child case, a little boy in New York State, right near Saratoga Springs, in fact. What that turned out to be, a father took off with his son, acrimonious marriage situation, so Green Mountain saw that I had a specific kind of experience. My husband's a very ethical man, Muriel said. By that I mean conscientious, Marcus said. Definitely. 
We haven't talked finance, as Lorca said, awkward but necessary, right? My parents left me enough for the express purpose of buying a house, Vero said. We'd let the bank work out the details then, Lorca said. Well, Zach, we don't want to overstay our welcome, Muriel said. And then, turning to Lorca, we'll give you our phone number in Brookfield. We'll wait to hear from you. No. No, Lorca said. I have to go upstairs and lie down now. I'm suddenly quite tired. But you too. The house is yours if you want it. And why not? My intuition is as good as the next person's. Muriel and Zachary looked a little stunned. I think they wanted to show more emotion than they allowed themselves. Lorca took the reins in that regard and embraced them both and said, I really must lie down, but please go look at the barn and maybe take a walk up the road, whatever you like. I have every confidence that the property and the views will shore up your decision. And then Lorca went upstairs. I could tell that she didn't want to be seen or to see anyone. Muriel and Zachary did not walk up the road. I'm sorry, Muriel and Zachary did walk up the road and then they drove off. When in two hours Lorca woke, she went downstairs and prepared some tea. Carrying her cup, she began her own private tour for her own edification. With, with this of course is the kitchen. I remember the time Ed sat here and told us about what happened one night when he was captain of the volunteer fire department. And Curtis told about a wild incident she mentioned she witnessed when she was a journalist in Greece. On and on in every room, including our bedroom, where she said, oh, well, what went on here isn't part of the tour. <laughs> in the kitchen at about 6 o'clock, Lorca made a salad. The news went on, was on Vermont Public Radio. She ate the salad standing up, looking out the kitchen window. And then she put out a bottle of vodka, a bottle of orange juice, and a glass on a tray and carried it up to the master bedroom. But she decided to lie down in the guest room instead. The mix, she mixed a drink and took a few sips, and then a more substantial gulp, and set the glass on the bedside table. Rearranging pillows against the headboard, she situated herself comfortably and began to page through a book of Cezanne landscapes. She f finished her drink and concocted another, this one heavier on the vodka. I don't think I've ever felt so tired in my life, she said. It is a mystery why someone would speak out loud to themselves. Lorca was asleep by 8 o'clock. In the morning, she woke at 5.45, just getting light out. A barred owl called from one of the maples out front. Lorca could hear it all the way around the house, the varied acoustic collaborations of our hill, trees, road, field, barn, wind, and breezes alike. She had slept in her clothes. She went into the bathroom of our bedroom, peed, washed her hands, splashed water on her face, and patted it dry with a towel. She brushed her teeth and then went downstairs. She ground coffee and sifted into a number four paper cone fitted into a glass beaker. She put on a kettle of water on the stove. She looked out the window and puttered around, and when the water boiled, she poured it into the cone and waited for it to empty, and then filled a mug with coffee. And for the first time I had ever seen, she did not add milk. A small but startling detail to me. She stood looking out the, win out the window again. A moment or two went by. To me, Lorca seemed all alert composure. Simon, my darling, she said, still looking out the window. She held her mug in midair. Whenever you saw that I had something urgent to share, you just say, just tell me. So I must tell you, Simon, I've sold our house. Thank you. I think probably this is all familiar stuff to a lot of you. <laughs> Ron's going to pick his sister-in-law up at the train station. <laughs> this is how small a community we have. We know these things. We know these things. Um, anyway, you guys, we're all familiar with each other, but if there's any, anybody wants to ask a question, please do. Yes, Nadel. I don't 
think it's um, anything that's uh, dramatic. It just means, I, I mean, I've written a bunch of them, and I also wanted to end up writing a novel set here, so sort of narratively homecoming. And I've just, um, my way of thinking narratively has changed, and I'm writing a book about friendship and uh, the painter Jake Berto, who's an old friend, and and I find myself well writing it in it that I'm applying a lot of things that I learned or think I learned writing novels. So maybe that's a kind of segue. Um, and I and I just think it's a good decision for me personally. I don't think it's a um, one that has to do with despair or disenfranchisement from the form or what's going on in the world of publishing or anything like that. It's long thought through and it's not, uh, I wish you wouldn't have mentioned it. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's enough elegiac elements in this book, you know, to, uh, but I, I, I it, it's a, it's, it, 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 it it's sort of like you don't want to have to talk about a writing life. It just leads you where it goes, and I think it's a good time for this for me. And now I'm 70, and I thought, well, um, the emotional dimensions of things outside of made-up stories are starting to become more uh, insistent. Mm -hmm. And I thought that, that would be a good, this would be a good time to do that. Mm -hmm. But thank you. That's a sweet question. Thank you. Did you find someone to jump out of the closet for that interview with Jane Lindsay? I was trying to find somebody to be upstairs when Jane <laughs> was over and called down eerie sounds, but it, no one volunteered. Uh, After Tolstoy gave up writing fiction, he wrote Resurrection. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is a point in which Barry's erudition elevates me. Um, to a place that I shouldn't be, but thank you, Barry. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, I would say <clears throat> maybe more like my difficult grandfather stopping writing fiction or something like that. It's not on that level of regard. Yeah? Is this why you use people's real names this time? More? So I always have. Um, it's just that they have lived in Nova Scotia. <laughs> in, um, in, in, a, in, in a novel that came out in 1994, The Bird Artist, I had a guy, uh, the lighthouse keeper's name was Botho August. And I take things from gravestones, usually names like that. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I met, but this is a man I met in St. John's. And I said, can I use your name? And he said, how much does a person get for something like that? <laughs> and I said, uh, $10 Canadian. <laughs> and he's, he signed it over to me, the contract over to me, on a napkin, which I framed, you know. And um, so, uh, but Jane asked me that question, too. And, I, and, I, and what I really feel about this is that um, my feeling is that everyone in this book, who we all know, is comporting themselves in the ways they do with tremendous dignity and humor and struggles and everything out front. Mm -hmm. And I, and I um, was very aware that in Chekhov's letters he writes about how euphemism becomes ostentatious. That if you, if you keep trying to find substitutes, it'll make the thing even more featured. And I, I just didn't want to do that here. The only person I made up was a kind of a amalgam of difficult um, general store owners, uh, but I've never had these experiences at the Adamant Co-op that, that this character in here does at all. It's my it's my hangout, the Adamant Co-op. So um, and so yeah. So I mean, I I felt um, maybe my own criterion for judging the uh, intimacy was may be refined by using people's names. And besides, I mean, why say the owner of the Savoy? <laughs> I mean, we all know. I mean, you, the book won't sell to anybody but people here anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> what difference does it make? It might as well be people you know. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you know how you, let, you meet people at a certain point in your life and you sort of wish they were all friends for even much longer than you know them. And 
So I think it's probably, um, it's probably some, the emotional dimensions are probably something like inclusive in that way, I think. That's just was my loose-knit thinking about it. Um, anybody, I mean, you know, yeah. In your first novel, uh, The Northern Lights, there's an entire chapter uh, of letters back and forth between two uh, child characters. And I was wondering how that idea came to you. Did you get any pushback from the publisher when you first mentioned that you were going to do that or were considering that? Letters? Yeah, there was the letters from Charlotte to Noah in, uh, in The Northern Lights, and it was the, the entire chapter was... Yeah, they were all just made up. Um, but um, I have letters in a lot of my books. In fact, uh, a whole, I, I wrote a whole novel that is one letter. It, and I think it's just a fealty for an epistolary form. I, I, I still write a lot of letters, and um, you know, <laughs> I, like, I like the form. And um, if you tell a publisher you're going to write an epistolary novel, they faint. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I like it. I try to put letters in almost everything. Um, and. Uh, and you know, I'm of an age where you're looking back at whatever archive one has, where there's suddenly uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters, um, and it's really shocking to to know it. Email is not quite the same, although I love it. I love writing letters in email too. So I think it's the the, the actual uh, texture of letters that I wanted in that book. I thought it worked really well. I loved it. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm so intrigued by this point of view, you know, that a, a ghost, you've got the first person thing, but it's almost like a close third as well, because you've got this observation of these people who don't know they're being observed. Is, yeah. is this a form anyone else has used as far as you know? It's, it's, it's just it's well, sure. I mean, it, it, it's not, I'm not that original. But what I tried to do with this, I needed to have somebody who um, need to slowly come to the realization that what he was doing was wrong, that it was like extending his writing life into the afterlife for his own reasons, and then it, it takes his wife to tell him, uh, you think you're doing something on somebody else's behalf. And I think an altruistic motivation is always suspect. <laughs> and so I, I really wanted to make, I always wanted to make that very clear in this book. and. Um, that's not giving anything away because I think things happen on every page. So, um, but yeah, I, I, um, I wanted. Well, I, I guess it's strictly autobiographical, if you will. I mean, oftentimes I'll just walk up past Jody and David's house, and as I'm coming back, and especially if it's around dusk and there's lights on in the house. I, where, where, you can't help where your mind goes, right? And I, as much as I would like to, um, I, my mind always goes to that. Is that if um, I better get, I better get there, I better get in there. There's always just a little touch of urgency about it, because uh, you, you know, um, there's a sense of abeyance, I think, and I think I wanted to create that uh, atmosphere, uh, not so much spectral as melancholy. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I really wanted to try to. I, I quote this a lot, but my fav one of my favorite Japanese writers, Aku Tagawa, has this line, you know, where he asks, what good is intelligence if you cannot discover a useful melancholy? And so I think one use to put melancholy too is to create an atmosphere in a book. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what I was trying to do. Um, the first draft of this book Everything that took place took place at dusk. And I wasn't even consciously aware of it until I read the first draft and I said, oh my goodness, no, that, that's not going to work. But you could see where the mood was trying to be set um, in a kind of um, uh, um, uh, with a certain certitude. And I had to open that up. You know, and you, these things happen over eight or 10 or 15 drafts of a book. As, as as writers here know, so poets know, painters know. <laughs> Lori, were you thinking at all about the Bardo state? Because when I when I read Robertson Davies' novel, where he you know 
the character stands over his murdered <laughs> self. Yeah, I know. And goes on. And what I he was a great man. Yeah, I what loved I loved him. about your book was that it really has that beautiful elegiac tone. And Robertson Davies, you know, was full of melodrama and yeah. satire and lots of other stuff, quite different temperamentally. But did you ever, did you ever think about the Bardo state? Yeah, That's once in a while I wake up it. and think that that I'm already in it. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I, I, you know, it's just a, seventy years of it. Um, I, I hadn't thought of that per se in terms of the. Uh, the stricter paradigms or definitions in because the in, Bardo state makes you in in in, Bo in Buddhism, which is um, something I would look forward to. I think um, as as Heron as it might be, and there are various versions of it. Um, and you know, you could you could ask Susan Wolpe about this because she knows a lot about this. But there's different kinds of Bardos. Um, but I I wasn't so much thinking about that, Laurie. What I was thinking about a lot was about how not to live at a certain age, um, paying attention to the moment you're in, but also being in a state of elegiac anticipation. And, and uh, when I went to see our friend Jake Berto when he was dying, that's what I experienced. You know, like, I just wanted to pay attention to him and listen to his fugue state of philosophical agitation and his crazy stories and his love for painting and so forth. But at the same time, I felt, you know, I'm already sensing what this is going to be like. And it wasn't comfortable at all, and I didn't like myself for that. But here, then I created a whole book in which somebody is really in that state of anticipating what things would be like. I suspect it's intrinsic to a certain age that one gets, but it may not be. Uh, I just don't know. But in the Bardo per se, um, mm -mm, not really. I mean, not a, not in the way I think you mean it. Yeah. Hey. I uh, have only read a chapter that actually a friend has read to me. He didn't hear what you're saying. I've only read a chapter of the book <laughs> that a friend has read to me. But I was wondering if the library itself is a character in this book. God, yes. Oh, yeah. And can you talk? There's about a cat. You uh, see, like. I don't want to go on because everybody's got things to do, but what happened was is that there was, we have an alarm in the house for smoke alarm and stuff like that. And what happened was a couple years ago, it's reported by room into the central thing in Montpelier. And the one in our house that said motion in library, it kept going off. And everything else in the house was fine. And so these Work, these technicians would come out and say, you know, well, you know, everything can happen. I put it in this book, you know, a spider can get electrocuted in there or well, the wind can set it off. We can't find what's wrong. And the third time this guy came out, he was wonderful. And he came out and he said, I said, well, what is causing this? And he pointed to the very thick volume of the collected poems of Wallace Stevens. And he said, that book would have to fly around the room and, and gain speed and slam into the ground and, to set off the alarm. And I thought, I have to write a novel <laughs> about that happening, which it does. So that was really the, the origin. The other origin of this book was really not to do with family and love and marriage and loss and, and love, the desire to love somebody else and all these kinds of things. It had to do with moths. Um, it, it's like all of us who live in houses, you know that almost every night in the summer, your house, um, not willfully, but inadvertently, murders moths. And so I spend a lot of time returning moths in the mornings. And so I gave the little missing girl this, this, this gift to return them. So novels, my, my novels, I should say, start in little strange ways, and then everything else that you've been thinking about is added to it. So what was really about that alarm and these moths, and, um, and all of it takes place in the library. You know, 90% of this book, or 80% of it, takes place in the library. And, uh, and um, I suppose um, because literature is 
contains time, maybe there's an element of that in it. Um, but when Jane Lindholm came out to the house, I put that book of Wallace Stevens right out front, and she said, I should have brought my scale. <laughs> she, she really didn't realize how many poems he'd written. <laughs> it was kind of funny. Anything else? Thank you very much for coming.